Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Shadow Tech Goddess Part 3. Welcome to Part 3, Chapter 1. Ing! In our last chapter, Paymaster Stenstrom was given a personal and lavish tour of the Shadow Tech Goddess's Garden of Horrors. Which is a little bit misnamed. There's really nothing horrifying about the garden. It's rather lovely. Has he stepped in to the garden perimeter? All of the plants, which were dried up and withered, came to life. And she explained to him that, surprise! Hey, Master Stenstrom, you are an extra planar entity known as a Kadar Gamain, which means he appears in every gosh darn universe and realm, pocket plane, and improbable dimension that there is. That's a rare distinction. He's not the only one, though. There are plenty of Kadar Gamains, but when you consider the vast population of the universe, the few Kadar Gamains that are out there is an infinitesimally small number. There's men, Kadar Gamains, there's female Kadar Gamains, there's ones that are forces of nature, weather events, ghosts, ghosts, and other assortment of odd things. And their, their role in the greater scheme of things is to serve the function of an antibody protecting the body from deleterious agents should unauthorized persons cross from one universe to the next it's the Kadar Gamain's job to take them down and they are drawn to the Kadar Gamain one way or the other one way or the other once they come into contact with the Kadar Gamain they are supposed to destroy them or get them hence out of thy universe and to whatever pocket plane that is uh, easily convenient. That's their job. They didn't ask for this job. They didn't apply to this job, but that's their job. And they are rewarded with power, unheard of, favor, with privilege. That's a bad word these days, isn't it? But that's what they get. They have the love of their Murthig, their soulmate. And the Murthig sort of completes the Kadar Gamain supercharges them into unheard of power levels. We're talking Dragon Ball Z power levels. And the Murthig, as a reward, is it's a symbiotic relationship where the Murthig gets some of that power for themselves. And all these entities, these horrors, if you will, are located throughout the garden in statue form. K Master Stenstrom finds a statue of Gwendolyn of Malazar, of Private Tara, and some other people, of, of Kat, of this creepy, creepy entity known as the Tempest Fendal, who is even now seeking to suck him dry like a tarantula spider. <laughs> and that the Tempest Fendal is relentless and freaking nuts, but, but capable of feeling remorse for what it has done, capable of creating arcane trinkets that will thwart itself from sucking the Kadar Gamain dry. And if they happen to do that, and the Kadar Gamain fades from one or more planes of reality, they become a Kadar Gogol, which is powerless, the one who is almost everywhere. Captain Duval was a Kadar Gamain. He could summon the Hall of Mirrors to it. He called it St. Mary's Axe, but then the Tempest Vendal got to him, sucked him dry, and he became a Kadar Gogol. And you don't want that. You don't want that. The Shadow Tech Goddess then gives Paymaster Stenstrom a Shadow Tech Bullabong, which is supposed to protect him from the effects of the Tempest Vendal, and the chief of which is its ability to create this indescribable withering wall of Fear, that's kind of a tongue twister. They can create fear such as you've never known, and there's really no way you can just stand against it. You can steal yourself against it. You can't. You will drop to your knees and be thankful your heart doesn't stop in your chest. But with this bullabung around his neck, which was most likely created by the Tempest Fendal itself in one of its more lucid and remorseful moments, will protect him 
from this fear. He'll probably still be peeing in his pants, but he'll probably still be able to function a little bit, still be able to think and react to some extent. Also gave him a stone dagger made from the site of the Tempest Vandal's Findle March, which is where it became a Tempest Vandal, where all other aspects of it in the universe, in the various universes, were killed except for that one instance, and that's what makes it a Tempest Vandal. And it is vulnerable in that place and to the method for which it all the other ones died off in this Spindle March. And this case, it's a stone, the, the stone of its old either castle or habitation, whatever you will. So he now has the Bolabong, and he has this little knife that can kill the Tempest Fidel. And he's like, well, why are you giving me these things? What is it that you want? And the Shadow Tech Goddess says, I want you, you, sir, you Kadargamane, you, in my debt. And then he, his mind returned to the Seeker. And that's where we left off. Let's proceed immediately, shall we? Part 3, Chapter 1, Ing! Stenstrom was still recovering from his bout of gift valve. He recounted to Gwen his experiences, all that he'd seen, the hall, the legions of women, the garden of horror, and the otherworldly woman who called herself the Shadow Tech Goddess. Gwen had sorted through his thoughts to assist him in analyzing his dreams. All she saw was a black void. Being a very logical person, Gwen deduced that all he experienced was a gift valve fueled hallucination tinged with bits of partially remembered detail from his experiences in Clovis. But it had certainly seemed real to Stenstrom, so he asked her to research some of the terms the Shadow Tech Goddess had used. Kadar Gamain, Tempest Vindal, Murthig, Merton, Covis, Kadar Gogol. She checked the ship's archives and library. Nothing. The terms had no meaning. It was just a hallucination, she said. But what about the bolabung and the stone knife? He showed them to her. Are you certain you didn't make these yourself? She asked, holding them up. You've got a whole arsenal of arcane kit on you at all times. I think you made these items and just don't remember doing it. She discounted the trinkets as products of an absent mind, and his dreams as hallucinations. But the dreams didn't stop. Every evening, with Gwen curled up next to him, he dreamed of someone sitting in the room with them watching them sleep. He saw its form sitting near the wall. He felt its eyes upon him. Gwen saw nothing, wrapping him in a technoplast haze and the haunting dulcimer-filled windstream of her more grounded mind. Night after night, one night he awoke in a terror that had come upon him from nowhere. He struggled out of bed, feeling his heart ready to fail, feeling unwanted eyes upon him. He took the bolabung the Shadow Tech Goddess had given him and put it on, wearing the bolabung. The fear, though not quashed entirely, faded to a manageable level. He took the knife and inspected his quarters, ready to defend himself if need be. He found nothing except a pulled out chair near his bed. The chair was warm, as if recently occupied. Stenstrom went back to bed wearing the bolabung, determined never to remove it, and he kept the stone knife within easy reach. Three days from Ing, he had the same old dream, somebody sitting there in the dark watching them sleep. Only this time, the figure spoke. Better wake up. Then, noise, confusion, someone was attacking the ship through the night of space, ambushed. The seeker, being an old stray light, had a minute blind sensory spot on the aft dorsal quarter of the ship, a flaw that had never been suitably corrected due to the stiff framework of the vessel. It was an issue easily compensated for by flying in a slight zigzag pattern. However, here in the middle of nowhere, the helm was flying the ship straight and true. The enemy ship came blasting through the blind spot, the attack precise and well-placed, hammering the underside of the seeker. 
taking out SM coils 1, 4, 6, and 8 in the first few moments. He started to yell a command to the comm, but nothing came out of his mouth. Through his windows, he got a good look at the attacker as it soared past. A Sprint-class league vessel. It was the George Parr. It had to be. In his dream, he whirled in mute frustration. How? How were they found? Sar beams crashing into the hull. Gases venting. Debris flailing out and sparkling. He tried to bark out the order to return fire, run out the damn guns and open up, loose the canisters. Again, nothing came out of his mouth. The door to his quarters opened and two figures darted in. The figures fetched both he and Gwen from bed. He was dressed quickly in the dark. Then, he was helped out into the corridor along with the limping, sleeping Gwen. No, no, I need to be on the bridge. The bridge! He was being led down to deck 10. The solid structure of the ship rocked again. Beat this goddamn tub to quarters and return fire! And then he dreamed of fog and hands raised in prayer, a yellow star in the distance, fog all around. He became aware of fast, cold air moving over him. He awoke and sat up. He was not in his quarters, nor did he appear to be on the ship. He was on a desolate shelf of dusty ground in the middle of a wilderness. The sky overhead appeared very low to the ground and was mottled with fast-moving brackish clouds. A chill wind blew past him. Gwen lay on the ground next to him wearing her partially unbuttoned uniform. She immediately reacted to the bite in the wind and put her arms around his chest, trying to stay warm. Where are we, Belle? She yelled. What happened? He took off his HRN and put it over Gwen's shoulder. She gratefully accepted it and ran her arms through the sleeves. Your guess is as good as mine, he shouted back. I had a dream the ship was under attack by the George Parr. I was trying to shout orders and get to the bridge, but I had no voice. It was led into the holds by a pair of shadowy figures. Gwen turned a little white. I also dreamed of that. He tried the Tregador. Tara, you there? He expected the worst. Tara! Thankfully, she answered. Bell, creation, where are you? She replied. We thought you'd been sucked out or something. I'm not sure where I am. I'm on a planet's surface. I don't know where or how. Gwen's here with me. Never mind us. What's your status? We're nominal. Still getting damage reports from all over the ship. We've lost a fair amount of our starboard SM coils and are venting on decks 9 and 10, aft section. Should have that fixed here soon. Casualties. Six so far, mostly from the areas that were vented. But the sounding continues and several crew are still missing. What about the attacking vessel? We were able to rally and lay into it with a canister and battle shot barrage, though it felt really rotten firing on a league ship. Was it the George Parr? I, we tagged it a good one. We blew off its port wing and it retired. Our sensing capabilities aren't the greatest right now, so her current whereabouts are unknown, though I've got lookouts posted. Aram was standing at the helm for the engagement. He flew us through. Aram? Yeah, but he's gone again. Our Lacerta friend on the George Parr mashed up our sensing units pretty bad with TK. All right, Tara, I want you to come about and return to the League, making as weather time as you can. Make sure you waggle so they can't sneak into our blind spot again. What about you and Gwen? We're fine. I think, given Aram's presence, that Alesta put us to the road. I think there's a good chance we're on Ing. Really? So don't worry about us. Get back to the fleet. Inform them what has happened and have them send out a combat box to get us. We should be fine until then. Perhaps in the meantime, Alesta and Aram will collect us. One can only hope. I'd rather have you on the ship, Bell. Well, that makes two of us. But the situation doesn't favor that, does it? We're fine, and since we've got our tregs, we can stay in contact as we will for a fair time. Get my ship to safety, and if you see the George Parr, lay into it with canister. 
you will have the advantage of range. And Tara, yeah, I'm glad you're all right. Thanks for getting my ship out of that mess. Keep me updated. He tregged off, and the two of them took a good look at their surroundings. They were atop some sort of plateau. A scrubby valley stretched off into the distance below them. The lighting was very poor. Gwen was rather put off. Can this truly be Aang? I believe it is. It's so dark and foreboding. Perhaps it's merely twilight or dawn. She looked around, not liking her surroundings one bit. If this is Aang, this is not what I expected. I've been doing a fair amount of research on the subject. Many of the texts indicated it was a place rather like Cana. I thought it would be like Cana. This can't be Aang, Bell. A fierce gale of wind kicked up the tails of his HRN. Perhaps the texts are wrong. The phantom of the Black Abyss at Magravine indicated Ing was a fairly inhospitable place and she didn't seem to miss it much. This must be Ing. They both looked around trying to take it in. It was an enormous moment, though a radically different one than Gwen had envisioned. I had hoped it to be a cheerier place, full of the memory of our ancestors. As you said, the footsteps of our ancestors are long since covered up. Anything that was built would have been claimed by nature long ago. This is just another aimless world now, populated by who knows what. Bell! Tara tregged in. We're good. All venting is controlled for now. But we'll need a dry docking to get fully repaired. The engineers are hard at the coils, and good news! One of the crew thought to be dead has popped up safe and sound. Are you sure you want us to make sail back to the League? We can be there at two-thirds sail in about five days. I don't want to leave you two behind. I know, Tara, but you have your orders, and I expect them carried out. I want my ship and crew made safe. And like I said, if Alesta brought us here, perhaps she'll bring us back straight away. Gwen recovered from her initial disappointment and began taking analytical stock of their situation. Looks like there's a moon off in the distance, a big one. I don't recall seeing a large moon through the telescope. She pointed with her fedula. A huge round object rose into the sky, obscured in haze and cloud. What else could it be? It's too big to be anything on the ground, Stenstrom said. Let's get off this shelf and find some shelter for the rest of the day. We can figure out our course of action later. A moment, he said looking at the ground. He produced a marzible and plunged it down. What are you doing, Bell? she asked, impatient to find shelter. By leaving a marzible here, I'll be able to relocate it with certain holy stones should we need to return to this spot for any reason. I'll leave additional ones every day or so, as it appears we have far to journey. He checked himself over. The Shadow Tech Bullabung was around his neck, safely hidden under his clothes, and the stone knife was in its usual spot. They found a safe trail into the valley below, and soon discovered a dry cave with a spring of potable water nearby. Being rather hungry, they decided to separate. Stenstrom, using his extensive herbal lore, went looking for plant forage in the woods, while Gwen, with her fedula and Mim's pistol, went hunting for meat. She took a few marzible with her in case she got lucky and managed to bag something big. Wandering through the woods, Stenstrom found an assortment of rough but edible plant life. Seeds, tuberous roots, and leafy greens. His years of study with his sisters and mother were paying off. As this was an alien world, he rightly expected the plant life to be just that, alien. However, he spotted a number of trees and plants that seemed rather familiar. In fact, the leathery black trees with the weeping branches looked an awful lot like the Nadine trees common in the north of Cana. He cut into the trunk of one and tasted the dark brown syrup that came out. Sweet, husky flavor. Tasted a lot like the Nadine syrup they made every morning in Blanchford Castle. His conversation with Alesta and Aram returned to him. 
He recalled the elders' practice of collecting the animal and plant life of their previous home worlds and seeding Cana with it. If that tale was true, then it was possible the hardy Nadine trees of North Cana were in fact native to this world, not Cana, and therefore this planet could only be Earth, Camera, Emira, Lemuria, or Ing. He had a strong hunch, though, that this was in fact Ing. He didn't have to worry about losing Gwen. She stayed in his head, giving him frequent updates. She was becoming more at ease sharing her thoughts with him and was liberated by it, sharing not only thoughts, but feelings, impressions, and other empathetic tidbits. She was always in his head now, nesting there. It was like holding her hand. He felt how hungry she was, as well as her growing frustration. Gwen was proving to be a poor hunter, making a lot of noise, wasting time in the same spots over and over again, and not hiding her presence well. He didn't place much stock on her bagging anything substantial today. It began to get very dark, and they returned to the cave, Gwen having had no luck. They cleared the cave as best they could, and Stenstrom built a roaring fire near the cave's mouth using a red holy stone. They ate nuts and roasted stringy leaves and downed them with brackish water from the spring, his usual supply of small beakers coming in quite handy. The meal was rough, but it filled their bellies. Tomorrow we're eating meat, I promise you, she said, struggling with her leafy meal. You'll need to improve your hunting skills a bit. We both will. As the evening progressed, they sat by the fire and looked at the occasional stars through the breaks in the clouds. Gwen had a bellyache from their coarse dinner, and he held her. Their shared thoughts drifted around each other. So here they were, just the two of them, the first to set foot down on Ing in a hundred millennia, sitting on the dirt by a fire. Twenty-six bells, Cana's standard, was the time according to her ever-present watch. She put down her various mental blocks designed to keep out the thoughts of others. It felt good to stretch out. No noise, no stray thoughts. They were alone. Their thoughts chattered back and forth. This was a quiet evening at our manor. I'd sit you down and play you a tune on the dulcimer. I'm quite accomplished at it. In fact, that's what she wanted for her dowry gift. A grand, gilded dulcimer, brand new, never been played. There it was, splashed out in her thoughts. And what color would you like? She didn't care. Whatever color he wished to give her. Visions of a midnight blue dulcimer, or a red one, or possibly provincial pearly white flashed across her thoughts. And then they'd play a game or two of cards. She dreamed of such evenings with him. Though I'm a far-flung adventurer in the fleet, I'm really just a homebody at heart. I love being home. She wished they had some cards now. He laughed and waved his hands. A fine deck appeared, and Gwen gasped. How did you do that? She exclaimed, taking the deck and sorting out the cards. Magic, remember? Hold up. His voice. They had shared the evening and not spoken a single word. It had all been in his head. Amazing how fast he'd become accustomed to Gwen's telepathic ways. The words of the Shadow Tech goddess came back to him. Murthig. Symbiotic relationship. She draws a great deal of power from you. She shuffled the deck. For the card game, she decided to use her voice to teach him how to play. Very well, Lord Belmont. I'm going to introduce you to a game called Crazy Eights. Cheered by the cards, warmed by the fire, Gwen crossed her legs and dealt the cards, and they played in the flickering firelight. Two stars there in the north, and a smaller greenish one to the south, and I think I see a nebula on the western horizon. Damn clouds. What time is it? Goodness, it's two bells. He awoke some time later. The hard ground of the cave bothered him a bit. Actually, it bothered him a lot. He'd have to find bedding or create a hammock of some kind. Sleeping on the ground was too much. Gwen was gone. She had been tucked into his side when they had finally nodded off after an hour or two of cards. He could feel the wedge of her thoughts buried in his brain. It didn't trouble him as much anymore. 
He'd become used to it. He sat up. Gwen sat at the mouth of the cave. She was wearing his HRN and apparently nothing else other than her watch. He could see her bare feet and legs stretched out in front of her. Her clothes were all neatly folded nearby in typical Gwen fashion. He got up a little stiff and joined her. She had efficiently cleaned out his pockets, an impressive volume of holy stones all organized into colored piles, arcane bits of Tyrol kit, pens, paper, string, cinnabar strikers, lockpicks of various kinds, silver candlesticks, and the shadow tech goddess's stone knife were all laid out in an orderly fashion. The only thing she had missed was his marzible, which she could never find. Only he could find it. She was sitting out in the cold by the dying fire, holding a pile of his papers, busily scribbling notes and checking her watch. She was looking upwards, holding his mega eye to her face. She'd come to terms with the disappointing reality of Aang, and the scientific part of her nature had returned in full. He seated himself next to her and she scooted into him a little. The sight of her sitting nude under the HRN was quite a thing to see. His coat kept her perfectly warm and comfortable from top to bottom. She didn't need anything else. What are you doing? he asked. She reached out and put her warm fingers to his lips. Shh. She wanted him to share his thoughts with her. Talking was unnecessary. Pedestrian. The way other people did things. Here on Ing, let them truly be together. He relaxed and let the waters of his thoughts flow and mingle with hers. What are we doing? She was trying to map the constellations and accumulate data as they went. She was very empirical and thorough, keeping a running log of sun up and sun down, moon cycles, charting the stars, that sort of thing. She planned on doing this every night. The sun went down precisely at 22 bells, 15 beats. All this information shall be invaluable when we return home. I'm anticipating the sun's rise to record its exact time. We have no idea when that will be at this early stage. She resumed her work. These damn clouds were making things difficult. Is there an infrared prism on this mega eye? He took it from her and gave the lens a twist. Ah, thank you. She kissed him and took it back. A few random thoughts of taking up the hem on his coat crossed her mind. It dragged to the ground when she wore it. As it fits me just fine, we'll leave the hem where it is, he said aloud. At least he thought he'd said it with his mouth. It was hard to tell anymore. She giggled. She entertained a few passing thoughts of breakfast, something warm and comforting, and she indulged in an erotic flash of what sex would be like on the hard ground. After the sun comes up and I record the time, let's have sex. A large break in the clouds passed overhead, and she made more notes. Until we secure a steady source of food, we probably want to conserve our energy. She silently agreed. She reached over and handed him her scabbarded ferdula. She wanted him to be a deer and etch their names into the wall of the cave somewhere. They needed to create tangible proof that they had been there. That was crucial. Screw that bitch, Sherlamp. Oh, look at that constellation. She plotted its shape in her notes and recorded the time of its rising. He pulled the blade from its scabbard. The fedula was a tiny, rapier-like sword that felt flimsy and tin-like in his hand. She objected to him holding it in such a limp manner. This wasn't a gilded museum piece or a show pony. This was her fedula. She fought the Lacerda tooth and nail at Caroline with this tiny weapon. She took it from his hand. Tin like show pony, eh? She promptly plunged the delicate blade into the solid rock of the cave floor, burying it near to the hilt and a shower of colorful sparks. Her thoughts came in a bundle. It's made of a blend of metals found in a unique quarry near our home in Xenon. Images of a rubble strewn rock quarry entered his mind. A tiny Gwendolyn standing there with her father and her sisters, digging finding bits of shiny metal gummed up in the rocks. Gwen sunburned with a basket full of rocks, a large hat tied to her head to help protect her skin as she dug. The smelting and casting. 
Gwen, watching the craftsman hammer the metal she'd picked from the quarry with her own two hands. I'll show you someday soon. I'll take you there. It's a place of riches. I'll show you it all. She then pulled it back out of the ground and showed him the blade. Perfect, just as stainless, delicate, and unnotched as before. Gwen put it into his hand and got behind him and demonstrated how to properly hold it, guiding his arm with her arms. Not being a swordsman, he was clumsy with it. No, no. Here, adjust your grip. Like this. He felt the contour of her naked ribs and stomach behind him as she silently instructed him. Effortless, he carved their names into the wall of the cave. Here was Lord Stenstrom and Countess Gwendolyn of Belmont, South Tyrol, rediscoverers of the planet Ing. March 17, 004772AX. As before, we walk here again. A crimson diamond appeared in the east. Dawn, Gwen grabbed her notes and pen. March 17th, sun up, five bells, 26 beats, or 522 HST. Later, Gwendolyn, after her long night, was sound asleep next to him, still nude within the posh safety of his coat. One of her arms draped over his shoulder. His mega-eye weighed down the stack of notes she'd made, and his pen was neatly arranged near her head. He groaned. His innards felt rough from dinner last night. Sashing his ints, he let Gwen continue to sleep and set out to find more forage, preferably something a bit more protein-heavy and easy on the digestion. He felt a bit naked without his HRN as he set out into the scrubby woods in his linen shirt, but Gwen needed it more than he did right now. It was cold this morning, probably somewhere just above freezing, though he'd felt the temperature rapidly rising with the sun. He wandered through the old forest, finding more of the same from yesterday. Seeds, coarse leaves, and roots. He gathered various bits, though he didn't relish the thought of having to eat them again. Ah, look there! Through the trees, he spied a vast meadow. On a distant hillock in the center of the meadow, he thought he saw a robust ground covering of white flowers. Flowers meant the possibility of fruits and berries. The petals themselves might be rather succulent. Flowers also might attract some type of insect life, which might in turn attract larger flesh-bearing predators such as birds, which might even bring larger game. Stenstrom had never considered himself much of a hunter and was rather a pacifist when it came to animal life. He was, however, somewhat amazed by how quickly the veneer of civility and pacifism fell away when faced with the mother of all realities, an empty stomach in a barren land. Adoring animals was best left for another, more satiated time. He readied his ints and made his way to the hillock. Being larger and farther away than he first thought, it took a while to walk there. When he reached it, he was pleased. He found dark blue berries growing in abundance. They seemed edible and had a rather sweet taste. A wondrous find. Gwen would love these, and he eagerly gathered as many as he could. His HRN would be ideal right now for carrying such a haul. Higher up the hill, the plants that were in flower should bear fruit later on. He marked the hillock with a marzible. Off in the clear morning distance, he saw the same gigantic moon Gwen had pointed out yesterday, hulking low on the horizon and appearing rather mottled and brown in the morning light. It seemed to be in the same position as it was yesterday. He continued his work, picking sweet berries with abandon. He cursed the loss of his HRN, stuffing berries into his pockets. He'd probably need to return and get more. He'd head back to the cave and bring Gwen and his HRN along with him. That moon, the huge moon on the horizon, hadn't moved one little bit in all this time. In fact, as he watched the morning sky slowly fill with clouds, he was certain he saw a cloud disappear behind the moon. Therefore, it could not be a moon. It had to be something colossally huge on the ground. Something so large, the very thought of it sickened him to some extent. He hurried back to the cave and woke Gwen up. You're sure? 
Gwen said as she chewed her breakfast of berries, popping in one after the next. I'm certain. Let me see, she said, her nest of mentality opening up. She gently sorted through his thoughts and saw the image of the giant sphere in the distance with the clouds moving behind it. So what does that mean? What could it be? I really don't know. I have a feeling that our destination is that thing, whatever it is. Aram's instructions weren't clear, and Professor Sherlamp certainly gave us no insight. Perhaps that monolith yonder is a structure of some sort. Perhaps that is the Shrine of Baraster. Bell, that thing breaks the clouds. I'm just saying, I think we should make our way in that direction. It's an obvious point of interest in any case. Gwen finished the berries. All right. What are we waiting for? She stood, still nude other than his HRN. Your clothes, Gwen. She laughed. You know, being here all alone with you is rather liberating. Why bother with clothes other than stout shoes to protect my feet? Seems pointless, really. She took off his HRN and handed it to him. She instantly recoiled, feeling the cold hit her full. Teeth chattering, she quickly dressed as Stenstrom gathered the objects she'd removed and returned them to their proper place in his coat pockets. Her fleet uniform was poorly suited to the cold conditions, and he didn't need telepathy with her to understand how desperately she wanted his coat back. He handed it over. You're going to have to carry everything if you're going to wear my coat. He reached in and pulled out his marzible, startling her. Where did that come from, she thought. I emptied your pockets. He let her see it, holding it, testing its well-balanced weight. She wondered if she was holding it correctly. Gwen, being a master swordsman with a full-size blade, was not a dagger user. Like this, he said, taking it from her. Quickly moving his hands, the marzible vanished. He shook his hands, and three appeared between his fingers. I know what you're thinking, that these are all extensions of the original one I just showed you. As long as I have the original Marzable on my person, I can produce as many of these extensions as I choose. I'm never without another Marzable to throw. I'll wager one of these will fetch us dinner this evening. Dinner. Food. She smiled. She was hungry. He felt the blossoming emptiness of her stomach, even after her breakfast of berries. They set out from the cave, Stenstrom retracing his route through the woods to the hillock. They climbed up the side and gathered more berries, Gwen doing more eating than collecting. There was the huge round shape in the far distance to the west, low on the horizon as before. He pointed it out to her and she stopped eating in mid-chew, amazed at the sheer size of it. Her logical, scientific mind had trouble accepting that such a thing could be artificial. He thought it might be a statue. Possibly a Braster himself. Impossible. Why not? What does an elder look like? They don't look like anything. They're ethereal. They are not. Regardless of their silent disagreement, it was clear that the massive shape in the distance should be their destination. They finished up on the hillock and set out, moving west through the forest. Eventually, the forest gave way to a long, open steppe land dotted with hillocks, a very unique sort of landscape Stenstrom had never seen before. This was Ing, an alien world after all, regardless of the fact that many of the tree and animal species he'd spied looked familiar. They looked about, seeking to discover some trace that their ancestors had stood upon this cold, forlorn ground. But as Gwen had mentioned, too much time had passed. Other than the gigantic shape in the distance, they saw nothing but wilderness. Gwen's open mind ticked out nuggets of logical information. Nothing of our people will be left upon the surface. Nature will have reclaimed it all. One hundred thousand years is a long time. Anything left of our ancestors would be underground, where the forces of time move at a slower pace. What about the giant-sized eminence ahead? It seems to have survived nicely. I dispute that is an elder-made construction. And on and on it went, silent, friendly banter conducted between two people who would one day be married, walking alone yet completely at ease in each other's company. The climate was relentlessly windy and cold. 
Good thing for his HRN, for Gwen would be suffering without it. They followed a shallow stream of clear, cold water trysting through the hollocks. Stopping for lunch, Gwen gathered materials to sustain a fire while Stenstrom fished in the stream. He had a bit of success, managing to snag a few odd creatures resembling eels with his thrown marzible. They cooked them and ate, both savoring the taste of meat on their tongues. They stared at the huge, round object dominating the horizon. And with that, we conclude Part 3, Chapter 1, Ing. And I really enjoy stuff like this, just flat-out world building. Even though this world isn't is bare and sparse, it's still fun creating this fictional place that used to be the home world of the League, but so much time had passed that it appears, at least in this part of the planet, that anything that was built on the surface is long since fallen back to nature. I like that sort of thing. I like that sort of forlorn quality that I created with Ng. Me and my wife went on a zip lining tour a few years back. It is in, uh, in the woods north of Columbus and we had several stops, you know, you hook on and you zip from one stop to the next. It's all high up in the trees. And at one point, they said there is a, an old school that the zip line passes over. It was, you know, from the 30s or 20s or 30s, some time back. And it had been abandoned and had been left to nature. And they said, keep a sharp eye out for it as you zip overhead. So my turn I'm zipping out and I didn't see any of the school it had all been reclaimed by the by nature it was all forest I saw the bell tower from the school just a little metal tower with a bell on top of it which was in like a little meadow you know surrounded by the forest and and I really I really liked that I thought it was cool you know there was this school where kids once learned and now it's abandoned and fallen to seed and pretty much covered up by the processes of of nature and it's only been abandoned you know for several decades shows you how fast things return to nature if there aren't people around to to maintain them to hold the nature back and i was trying to convey that scene or that same thought with ang that there could have been grand cities once where they were standing and you just would never know it because it's just been swallowed up except for this weird round eminence in the distance and we'll find out what that is next week next week part three chapter two the welcoming colossus and that sounds like it's going to be fun fun as paymaster stenstrom and gwen explore this desolate and inhospitable but oddly inviting world of ing and we'll see what uh, they find as they proceed towards this big thing in the distance until then this is ren presents i'm your host ren peace out